Hi everyone. Um, yeah, you haven't heard much from me lately directly, and one of the reasons for that, or the main reason for that, is because this channel was almost knocked off of YouTube. Ah, uh, that's right, no more Cujo, no more Ziggy, no more Jordan Peterson and the Nietzschean Dilemma. Now, part one of the Nietzschean Dilemma series is coming up, but I had to get this off my chest first, otherwise there won't be a channel and it's very difficult to get one of these up and running on YouTube these days. It's not like the old days. So prepare yourselves. I've channeled all of my anger into the following short film. Enjoy. Yosemite Strike, a diary of July 2018, a satirical short film by T. McLean full based on a true story. Well, Ziggy, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy about that scoop we got last night with Jordan Peterson and the Laurier lawsuit. I think it's the best news clip I've ever uploaded. It's doing really well. I told you, man, it pays. It pays to stay up until 3.30 in the morning rooting through all this stuff. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> you never know what kind of breaking news you'll come across. You know, it's what I've been saying. Oh, just a second, there's an email. Oh. What? What the heck is this? Hi, team. Clean full. We had to take your video down from your copyrights. Oh, jeez, Ziggy, it's the... Laurier video, it's the scoop! It's the scoop! They took it down with a copyright strike, the Aspen Institute. Oh man, I never heard of them before this interview, and it looks like they really are some beatnik community college. There's a million reasons not to do this, and only stupid reasons to do it. I'm not some clip cranking farm, I'm. <sighs> This is newsworthy. It's covered by fi- All right, calm down, Team McLeanful. Calm down. Calm blue ocean. Burgundy chair. Brown table. Blue book. Black television. Calm down. All right, Ziggy, this is what we'll do. We'll create a video explaining what we're doing here. News events can be generated from podcast interviews. Yes, yes they can. Just like news events can be generated from mainstream interviews. It's covered by fair use. As long as you have a news angle and it covers all four points of fair use, we'll just explain who we are. Maybe what they need is an intro and an outro. This Aspen Institute sounds like some community college. We'll just do another video, we'll explain it. Everything will be fine. A short time later. Hey everyone, Jordan Peterson did a talk at the Aspen Institute and he was asked about the lawsuit against Wilfrid Laurier University and he went into more detail. He sort of gave the justification and the argument behind why he's initiated the lawsuit. And I was hit with a copyright strike by the Aspen Institute. So let's get this clear. I'm an independent journalist. I cover the intellectual dark web and specifically Jordan Peterson. And right now I'm specifically covering the developments of the Lindsay Shepard affair. And there are a lot of comments coming in of people saying, you know, this is hypocritical. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that Jordan should take advantage of the law? So Aspen Institute, I'm a journalist. This is a journalism channel. We cover the intellectual dark web, Jordan Peterson. We talk about the latest developments. We analyze what he might be doing. We analyze what his critics are saying. A short while later. Well, I sure am glad we cleared that up with the Aspen Institute, Siggy. You know, people make mistakes. It's understandable. I just hope that, you know, moving forward, we can work together to Oh, hold on. There's another email just came in. Oh, look, Ziggy, it's a, another copyright strike from the Aspen Institute. The copyright struck my video talking about the copyright strike of my video. I just don't know if I can copyright <laughs> struck my video talking about the copyright strike of my video. 
Sometime later? Of all the things they teach these kids at these community colleges, Ziggy, why couldn't they at least teach them about the proper interpretation and application of fair use as it relates to copyright infringement when you're doing news reporting? Go! You know, Ziggy, people often quote four points that have to be considered for fair use when using unlicensed copyright material. But when you're doing news reporting, you really only have to worry about two things. One, did you transform the copyrighted material by using it for a different purpose other than that of the original? It's an isolated video clip that is news. That's what makes it a news clip. Do you understand me? No one else has carved it out to report it, not even the Aspen Institute. I am the first to report it, as I have so often been in the past, and that makes it a scoop. The Aspen Institute didn't report it, unless you want to say that they're trying out some new form of news reporting, where you bury an important story in a 90-minute interview, and then invite people to sift through it and see if they can find the news story. Aspen Institute News, always vague and confusing. No, I took a small portion I felt was highly newsworthy, I crafted a headline for it, I uploaded it on my channel, and I made a news story out of it and a place for people to talk about it. So yeah, I did, I transformed it. That's number one. Let's move on to the next point, which is, was the material taken reasonably appropriate in kind and amount considering the nature of the copyrighted work and of the use. Yes, yes, it was taken reasonably and it was appropriate and it was attributed and it used all of the standard practices of professional journalism, which is something that courts specifically look at when considering fair use cases. And you know what, Ziggy? If I ever make a video about this travesty, I'll be sure to elaborate at length on all of this at some point during the video. But right now, I'm just too angry. <laughs> To be a journalist, you don't need a degree like me. You don't have to have worked in the field. If you follow the proper practices, then you don't have to worry about getting struck by anyone other than someone who doesn't understand what they're doing. Like Yosemite Strike over at the Aspen Institute, which is apparently who they've hired to do their social media. These were manual strikes. They weren't automated. Yosemite Strike seems to think that the YouTube copyright notification system is their own personal master eraser button for YouTube. The beautiful shiny button! Now, some people say, well, what about the market value? You know, like you're taking away market value from them. You're taking views away from them. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. Let's, let's go over the numbers, shall we? Remember, Ziggy, when I found the interview between Barry Weiss and Jordan Peterson on the Aspen Institute channel? It had been up for about 12 hours and it had 4,900 views. Well, I found a news story and I uploaded my news clip and it received 93,000 views during the nine hours it was up there. During that same nine hour period, the Aspen Institute interview rose from 4,900 views to over 29,000 views. Now Ziggy, according to these YouTube analytics, you know that end card I put at the end of my videos that takes you to the source? Well, 651 people clicked on that end card during the nine hour period that my news clip was up before it got struck by Yosemite Strike. That means 2.7% of the views that the Aspen Institute interview got during that nine hour period were funneled by my news clip. But you know, Ziggy, YouTube doesn't keep statistics on the number of people who clicked on the link prominently displayed above the show more click point in my description. And YouTube doesn't keep statistics on the number of people who made a mental note to watch that interview later. They can't read our minds yet. And 
Of the people who made a mental note to watch the interview later, I don't know how many of those people are represented in the 25,000 views that the Aspen Institute got in the nine hour period that my clip was up. But you know what? I have a pretty good idea that the number of views I fed to their channel was high. Ziggy, I want you to come with me on a journey into the Aspen Institute's video and playlist feeds so that we can develop a better understanding of just how much market value I didn't steal from them. The way that the channel and these tabs are curated seems designed specifically to ensure minimum number of views and minimum number of engaged subscribers. They upload like 10 videos per day and during the Aspen Institute Ideas Festival when this Jordan Peterson interview took place they were uploading videos like every hour. You would need a whole separate email account just to handle the video notifications from the Aspen Institute YouTube channel. 99% of the Aspen Institute's 65,000 subscribers long ago unclicked the notification bell. And when you head over to the playlist tab, it's even more baffling. This is the playlist tab. You know, Ziggy, when I wrote this song 10 years ago, I was just screwing around on the piano. When I was finished it, I thought, you know, this might actually be good background music for some excruciatingly mundane task. And I never thought I'd get a chance to use it. But look at these playlists. Some of them have one video in them, and it just goes on and on and on. A playlist is supposed to aggregate a bunch of videos under a, a general topic. What the hell are you doing? And here it is today, June 30th. Why don't they take the clip and display it prominently on their front page? Because it was getting 20,000 views per hour. They could draw in a whole bunch of people, and then those people could spread out and start looking at other videos. I mean, they could watch a video clip of Brian Stelter talking once again about how America is in the midst of a national crisis. It has 285 views, and four upvotes, and nine downvotes, and seven comments saying mean things about the mainstream media. It has no description. In fact, as far as I can tell, most of their small clips have no description. What the hell are you doing? And here's a challenge for you. Pick any small clip from the Aspen Institute and try and search on YouTube for typical keywords, you know, things that are in the title or not in the title, and try and find that video through a search. That's a real challenge. I tried for a long time to find this Brian Stelter clip and I was unable to do so. You know why? Because there's no keywords. So there's no description and there's no keywords. No, God, please, no, no, no! Who are these two men? Why should I care what they have to say about the question posed in the title? If I wanted to find things that these two men had said to each other, and I wanted to search for the topic, or for them, or for anything, I wouldn't find this video. It would never pop up. It's just my opinion, but I detect a strong lack of focus here. And I don't know, I'm trying to find the word. There's something lacking here. There's something lacking. It's a word for it. I've heard it before. Conchi conscientiousness. That's what's lacking. There's like none on display here. Whoever is managing the curation of this channel seems to focus most of their energy on vanquishing their perceived enemies instead of on making their YouTube channel a place where their subscribers and the wider world audience would want to come and expose themselves to the kaleidoscope of progressive ideas this community college produces. But no, no, we're not interested in that. I mean, I made a video where I explained that I was a journalist, I presented the clip again, and they struck that video. There's a, a kind of obliviousness on display here, a kind of lack of awareness, and a kind of insular, introverted approach uh, and perception. What's the word on it? There's a word for that. It's like they're living in a, living in a, uh, like an enclosed, uh, a bubble. It's like they're operating from within a bubble and all they care about is, is protecting their bubble. Oh no, oh no, they're trying to penetrate our bubble. Oh, they're assaulting our bubble. Anyways, 
Ziggy. That's why their Jordan Peterson interview only had 5,000 views after being up for 12 hours. I mean, Ziggy, besides direct sharing, like receiving a text message or, or an email or seeing it posted to some external site like Reddit, for nine hours, the most powerful online funnel to that interview was the link in the description of my news clip. 93,000 people saw it over nine hours. And when people who just as a byproduct of doing some pretty good news reporting start funneling thousands of views to their channel, their response is to try to get them kicked off YouTube. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me at all if even six weeks from now, this Jordan Peterson interview with the Aspen Institute hasn't even broken a million views. Well, Ziggy, I've sent them two sternly worded counter notifications, and I had a meeting with the administrator of this channel and my personal assistant and confidant, Ben Murner, earlier this afternoon. And he has sent them a very strongly worded email. And it just so happens that Mr. Murner is a paralegal. So huh, I'd like to see the look on the faces of these community college kids when they receive a strongly worded email from a certified paralegal. <laughs> I gotta play hardball, Ziggy. According to YouTube, they have 10 business days to show YouTube that they're going to sue me for copyright infringement. We both know that's not going to happen. Ben demanded that they rescind the copyright strikes, and I don't see any reason why that won't be happening any minute now. So I think we're good to go. Five business days later. Oh, hey, Ziggy, I just got back. Um, I got a weird call from Ben a couple hours ago. Uh, he was sobbing uncontrollably. I could barely understand him. Uh, all I could make out was he kept saying, Google the Aspen Institute. And then he hung up and uh, he hasn't returned my calls. I don't know what's going on, man. I mean, Ben's kind of a soft touch. I told him to send them a strongly worded email. I, maybe I should have Googled them first. Maybe uh, we've hurt some feelings that you know we didn't want to hurt. I, I didn't mean to fly off the handle. Just wanted them to rescind the copyright strikes. It's been five business days. Maybe they're too afraid to even talk to us now. Let's take a look here. Oh, they have their own website. Good for them. Good for them. Oh, here's a wiki. Let's go in there. The Aspen Institute is an international nonprofit think tank. Think tank? Oh, how could they be a think tank? Founded in 1949. Value-based leadership, pursuit of common ground and deeper understanding in a non-partisan and non-ideological... Well, here's some more info. Uh, located in Washington, D.C. Revenue, $127 million. What? How could they have a revenue of $127 million? No. Annual budget... How could their YouTube channel be curated like that? Oh, what do they spend all their money on? Oh, I know. They spend their money on lawyers. They must have really expensive lawyers. They must have teams of lawyers and teams of lawyers watching their teams of lawyers. Oh no, Ziggy, what have I done? That's why they haven't rescinded the copyright strike. Maybe it doesn't matter if I'm protected by fair use. Maybe. Maybe having a $127 million annual budget buys you all kinds of things. Oh, crap, man. What have we done? This was a trap. A short while later. Ah, oh, Ziggy, I think I made a big mistake, man. I don't think I knew what I was doing. Oh, uh, what's gonna happen? What, man? What? What do you, what do you smell? What do you see? What do you hear, man? What is it? Is it... it is it the, the Institute? What's that noise? What the heck is that noise? What the... Oh, crap. What is that? Teeth clean for... Oh, there we are. Like, teeth clean for... Alright. Alright, so this is totally the Aspen Institute. And we're here to say that you challenged two of our copyright strikes. That's cool. So we're gonna be like monitoring you from like now on. So we hope that's cool with you. And also, uh, objectivity as found through like rational thought is a masculine and western concept that we're totally gonna challenge throughout this fight. Like, My 
God, Siggy, what have I done? The next uh, morning, eh, mon Dieu, qu'est-ce qu'il y a ici? C'est vraiment étrange ici. Siggy, I've been up all night, standing here in the dark, waiting for the next helicopter flyby. Why do I make assumptions, man? I... Uh, what kind of trouble have I got myself into now? I need something to take my mind off this. It's driving me crazy. Uh, it's just, I didn't think... Wait a minute. What's that sound? Is that music? <gasps> Ice cream! Oh yeah, this is exactly what I needed. Hello. everything here. See? I mean, it's got all the different slush flavors and then shakes. Anything you can think of, really. Sundays. It's awesome. Oh. Thank you. Everyone loves ice cream. Oh, geez. Vegans don't love ice cream, you sorbet-phobic tyrant. Well, that, that, I didn't expect that. That was unplanned. Mathematics is white meat. Uh, how, how'd they get to the police so quickly? Okay, at this point I cannot uh, say for sure what is happening um, from one moment to the next. Uh, this could be uh, several days in the future, but this could also be uh, several days in the past. I am not sure if time is moving uh, linearly at this point, uh, but uh, our friend Tim Cleanful is confused and uh, Let's say, en tout cas, sometime later. Russia, Vladimir Putin, Russia, 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 hate Russia, 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 A very important message to please stop smashing your curing coffee machine. An undecidable problem is a decision problem for which it is known to be impossible to construct a single algorithm that always needs to correct yes or no answer. This was all meant to be. We're sort of the glitch in the system. Like, to me, that was the undecidable in postmodern terms. There, there you go, right, yeah, that's right. it. I was just going to put some videos of Siggy and I up on YouTube. I, I, I couldn't work. I was really sick. I needed something to do. Google said this was my YouTube channel. It had been around since 2010. I don't even remember creating it. Shut up. You need to change your channel name. What should I change it to? What? what? I don't know. I'm a manifestation of your subconscious. I know what you know. Well then, why the hell are you here? Uh, to tell you that you're dreaming, and it's time to play. Ah! Uh... I know! Oh! Oh! Oh my god! Oh! Oh, Siggy! Siggy! Oh, I had a dream! Oh, I had a nightmare. 
Oh, and you were there, and the Aspen Institute, and helicopters, and they were ruining ice cream. And, oh, God, how long have I been? Oh, my God. It's been three weeks. I must have, I must have had a psychotic break and fallen into a, a coma. And look, look, the Aspen Institute, they didn't sue me. The counter notifications, they didn't show YouTube that they intended to sue. Why didn't they sue me? Could it be that they didn't have a f case? Okay, now it's time for a serious talk. I, uh, oh, Francois, Francois, you're still here. Mais oui, uh, I've been here for three weeks. Uh, I've been helping you. I've been changing your diapers uh, while watching you babble, you know, crazy things uh, for many days. Uh, just waiting for you to wake up so you can give me the money you promised. Oh, Francois, jeez, man. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I gotta get a, a lawyer on retainer in case this ever happens again. I mean, I need to be prepared for a, a better response. I uh, <laughs> Things are pretty tight. They're always tight for me. I don't have a $127 million a year budget, man. I, I'm, I'm sorry. What's this? I'm sorry. Well, I, I need mean, money. You promised me. Yeah. Man. Oh, look, Francois. Espesta cachon. Oh, Francois. Oh, Francois. Oh, Francois. Okay. So I've put a link in the description to a great article that explains all about the ins and outs of fair use when your intent is to report something that's topical or newsworthy. Now, I want to explain a little bit about this particular clip and why I chose it and why I posted it and why it was protected by fair use. The Lindsay Shepard affair is a big a subject in the public consciousness. It's a huge scandal in Canada's academic system. And uh, when Jordan Peterson announced he was suing Wilfrid Laurier University, that became an, a topic of public interest. So when he was being interviewed by Barry Weiss, and she began to ask him some detailed questions about his justification for launching the lawsuit, that event was worth reporting to the public. Now, this was an interview that was broadcast to the public, and the Aspen Institute chose not to report it as a news clip. They issued their clips before they even issued the interview. Of course, their clips have no keywords, so they have almost no views. This is Jordan Peterson. There's no excuse to have clips from an interview on your own channel that you conducted and, and they have no views. One of the things that made the Jordan Peterson No Regrets clip so potent was the excellent performance of the interviewer, Barry Weiss. I wonder how many people noticed. I personally am sick of the horrible left-wing ideologue interviewer that is trying to find a gotcha moment with Jordan Peterson. And that's not what you're witnessing in that clip. What you're seeing is a very capable interviewer applying the craft very well. Why did I include both questions? Not just the question about Laurier, but the question about what Jordan Peterson said about one of his critics. Well, the reason is because it's to show the way that Barry was leveraging Jordan and pushing him to justify what could be construed as a contradiction in terms of his principles. And so she asks him about something very harsh he said about one of his critics, and he justifies it. Then she questions why he is suing two people that said very harsh things about him, and he justifies it. Now, one of the interesting things that she gets him to do is to admit that he is committing an exception to one of his principles, that lawsuits for what people say, even if they're harsh, could create a chilling effect in academia. And he says that he's making an exception because of the situation. So I think that the clip works really well because Barry gets him to do that. 
and Newsflash Aspen Institute. I'm very lukewarm uh, as to Jordan Peterson's lawsuit against Laurier. Before he launched his lawsuit, he was a component of the Lindsay Shepard affair, and now he's injected himself as a central player. And I'm not sure that even if he has a case, it's worth the distraction. We have this Nietzschean dilemma to deal with. I think that takes priority. And I know for a fact from watching Rebel Wisdom that there are liberals, very uh, rational and interesting liberal thinkers that get tired and exhausted when Jordan Peterson uh, focuses on his beef with the university system and the things that have happened within the university system uh, or just starts going on about the far leftists. It, it's important to Jordan Peterson and I understand why he's doing it, but in the overall, if you step back, it, it just strikes me as a distraction that's not really necessary. Anyways, um, if it's topical and it's fresh and it's new and it's unique and it fits all of the proper criteria and you your intent is to report news and you have a track record of doing that as I do, then you are protected because you can show that in court and that's the most important thing is in court your intent has to be demonstrable. I mean, when The View had that dust-up between Whoopi Goldberg and that judge, Janine Pirro, uh, that was an event, a news event, and it was reported on. Now, do I need to inject myself into the news clip and come in there at the beginning and go, Oh, hi, everybody! Uh, I, I prefer not to do that. In fact, the more newsworthy something is, the less I want to inject myself into it. What I prefer to do is present it, then I like to aggressively curate the comment section and participate in the discussions, facilitate them. I'll let a few troublemakers through, of course, because I believe that all of the perspectives need to be aired out in the open so that they can be responded to. And uh, I just won't let troublemakers and trolls dominate and cancel out uh, fruitful discussions. So I, f I see that as my job. And I find if you do that, you have people engage in some really interesting discussions. A lot of people participate. You can participate as well. And that's the commentary and analysis part of, of the full news package. You know, I don't have panels with makeup done and you know, carefully coached during the commercial break. You have a pure grassroots form of analysis and commentary, and that's part of this new space that's opened up that Jordan Peterson has talked a lot about on his recent appearances, something he calls akin to a Gutenberg revolution, and that's the podcast revolution, the way people are now consuming information. There's a whole new world that's opened up, and it's dominated uh, by YouTube. So as long as there's something topical and it is new and it hasn't been clipped out by the, uh, the owner of the full-length source material, I'm going to upload it to my channel as a news clip and I'm going to facilitate the conversation about it. Now because my parameters for uploading a straight clip from a copyrighted source are so narrow, as you can see from my channel video history, these clips are very rare. They're like gold nuggets and I find them once in a while and when I upload them it's to clarify the record or to report something that's not being reported and as you can see from my channel history because they're newsworthy and because they're topical they do well. You can do this both casually and properly and you'll end up with quality over quantity. I'll have more to say about this. I'm going to follow this up with another video where I go over a lot of the background of what's been going on. A lot of channels have been knocked off YouTube in the last month. Some of them were doing the clipping stuff right some of them were doing it really wrong, but a whole bunch of people got uh, canceled out. And so I'll be giving some information, some sort of uh, backstage information about how I approach my channel. I'm not a full-time YouTuber, but I try to get to it as often as I can. And a disruption like what happened with the Aspen Institute is really uh, a, a real problem for me. So I've taken steps to protect myself, and I'll talk about them in the next video as well. And in the meantime, uh, Aspen Institute, this end card's for you.